This is Ahwal Online, meeting point of accurate news and free comment on the current affairs of Turkey. Welcome to our podcast series. Hello and welcome to a special episode of Talking Turkey in which we will pivot somewhat from our primary subject to examine what sustained isolation, which is increasingly common these days in Turkey and much of the world, does to our mental and emotional state and to our relationships and its longer term impact in the months ahead as we make our way through this coronavirus pandemic. I'm your host, Aval editor David Lepesca, and with me today are two guests, Frank McAndrew, who is the Cornelia Dudley Professor of Psychology at Knox College in Illinois, and Dana Rose Garfin, Behavioral Psychologist and Adjunct Professor at the University of California, Irvine. Hello to you both, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Thank you. Hi. We are speaking on Tuesday, March 24, and we've just passed 400,000 global cases of the coronavirus and more than 17,000 dead. As of today, one or maybe even two billion people worldwide have been stuck in self-quarantine for several days or even a week now, including about one of every three Americans and a similar number in Turkey, for which the CDC issued a level three travel warning just this morning. Perhaps for the purpose of this podcast, I'm being intentionally hyperbolic, but reading the steady drumbeat of grim news, it's hard to avoid the idea that death and disease are literally stalking us as we cower in our homes. A friend said to me the other day that it's taken us back to the Middle Ages when our villages were surrounded by walls and we were afraid of anybody we didn't know, anybody from outside those walls. Dr. McAndrew, you write a blog that's all about navigating the 21st century with a Stone Age mind. This pandemic has in some ways taken us back to those Hobbesian times. So please tell us, what sort of emotions and mental states are we likely to deal with as our isolation continues and how might we navigate through it? Well, yeah, it's uh, it's all very surreal, isn't it? It's like living in a zombie movie. Uh, <laughs> there's so There are so many different stressors uh, involved with being isolated like this. One of the big ones is simply uh, the fact that you no longer have your normal routine. One of the best predictors of stress is how many life changes are going on, what's different in your life. And uh, when suddenly you're not going to work anymore, you're not seeing your usual social circle, uh, you're not doing anything at the same time, this changes everything. And it's mentally exhausting. Uh, The good thing about a routine is it allows you to do a lot of things on automatic pilot. But now you have to think about everything all the time and it just wears you out. Uh, And then on top of that, you've got boredom. Uh, You're sitting around probably eating and drinking too much. Uh, There's just a lot of different bad things happening at the same time. And, And what are the best ways to deal with it in your view? Well, uh, I think, first of all, you do need to establish some sort of routine. You want to make this the new normal. And I think the longer it goes on, the easier that might become. You get sort of used to it. But it's very unsettling in the early stages, which is where we are now. Also, uh, as best you can, keep up social contact with people. And you want to do it in a way that comes as close to live face-to-face interaction as you can. So um, Skyping with somebody where you can see their face and hear their voice is a lot better than just texting or emailing because you're simulating an actual social interaction in a better way. Mm -hmm. A recent study in The Lancet found that quarantine can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, as well as confusion and anger, and that these effects can sometimes be long-lasting. Two University of Toronto professors studied people quarantined during the SARS outbreak and found that 31% had symptoms of depression and 29% showed signs of PTSD. So the threat is very real. Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti last week told people it's okay to cry. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be afraid. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo Uh, acknowledge the truly significant psychological stresses of these times and appeal to psychologists and therapists willing to volunteer to provide mental health assistance. Dr. Garfin, you've studied the mental and emotional impact of major traumatic events such as the Boston Marathon bombing and disastrous hurricanes, and you co-authored a paper out this week describing how media exposure during a shared trauma like this pandemic can 
amplify negative health consequences. So please tell us what happens to people mentally and emotionally in these situations and what might you advise to help people deal with the pressures of isolation and immobilization combined with coronavirus fears? Um, all right, so I'll make a couple think that's a great question. Um, so first I would want to comment on the media exposure issue and we see a, we see time and time again, I, so I did not seek to study the effects of media exposure um, in traumatic situations. However, over the course of the past several decades or in the 13 years I've been studying these issues, media exposure is one of the most robust predictors of psychological distress after a traumatic event. And indeed, in several of our studies, that is more strongly associated with post-traumatic stress symptoms than even being at the event. Even so than those, being closely... So it's, like it's crucial not to read the news right now. It is crucial to not be repeatedly exposed to the news over and over again. Now, I would say that particularly in a pandemic like this, where it's very important to be informed about what the current recommendations are in order to engage in the best health protective behaviors, you do want to be informed. So, you know, I think checking the news in the morning, checking the news, you know, in the evening, you know, should be adequate to get that information, you know, not that much is going to change about the recommendations in those eight hours that are kind of like your quote unquote working hours. And, and we see those effects really start to skyrocket at these higher levels. So I, I do think it's more of like having the news on all day in the background or, you know, constantly be reading it when, when essentially you're kind of reading, you know, the same information. It, it seems like a key difference between this pandemic and 9-11 or the Boston bombing or disastrous tsunami or hurricane is that those incidents are over in a flash. And and we can begin to assess the physical, mental, and emotional damage and begin the recovery. With, with coronavirus, we have no idea when or how the threat of infection or the need for isolation is going to end. So this not only seems to create a deeper sense of uncertainty and, and greater anxiety, but a need to kind of stay in touch at least a little bit with the news. What what, what do you think of that aspect, Dr. Berkman? Well, yeah, like I said, I, I think it's important to stay informed, right? But you can get the information from, you know, you can go to the CDC website, you can go uh, to your local government, you know, you could get sign up for updates about local news on your phone. And, you know, you can get that push notification when things change. You know, when you get that stay at home order, you know, when, hey, they close the beaches, you know, you can get that information in a relatively short period of time without having to have the news on for three hours, for four hours in the background. So, you know, I definitely think that especially using technology, those kind of signing up for push notifications, checking the CDC website, you know, I, I think that that's great. And I would recommend that for people. And I, I think there is a very... um you know, both qualitative and quantitative difference between that level of staying informed and staring at the news for three hours at the in, in the morning. Yeah, I would agree with everything that Dana said, but it's easier said than done. People absolutely hate uncertainty, especially when it's about something that has such big implications for them. And so even if you know, I'm not supposed to sit here in front of CNN all day long, you can't look away. Mm -hmm. You're desperate for any scrap of information that's going to help you figure this out or give you some sense of closure about when it's going to be over and what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to go where we want, uh, touching people, hugging people, just being close to people, especially our loved ones. These are fundamental human experiences, and they seem particularly important during anxious times like this. Yet so many of us right now are unable to do these things, and, and possibly for months. For me, personally, it's been particularly difficult. My mother passed away last Friday, and although we had been expecting it for some time, experiencing it with none of my family members around and not being able to return home for a funeral is deeply frustrating. And of course, I'm not alone. I'm sure tens of thousands of people, even millions, are dealing with this same problem right now, being unable to properly grieve together for lost loved ones. And then there's marriages as well, with spring right around the corner. I'm sure countless weddings have been canceled and surely more to come. Funerals and weddings, these seem like 
the events that define us as human. Dr. McAndrew, what what do we lose when we're unable to grieve for those who passed and, and celebrate our unions? Yeah, we um, there was a wedding just this week that my wife was supposed to be going to that's been canceled. Mm. Uh, yeah, and the perverse thing about this is there's a very old social psychological finding that our need to affiliate with other people is strongest when we're feeling anxious. And so at the very time that we need it the most, we're being denied that possibility. And uh, you're right about the missing of funerals and weddings. They, they mark important events in our life, and it's a way of reconnecting and reaffirming our membership in a family or a social group. And to have that ripped out from under you is just devastating. Yeah, I will say that my, my siblings and I all gathered for the first time in an online video chat the day my mother passed, and it was absolutely invigorating, actually, surprisingly. Um, are these kind of things we might do to bring some warmth to our days of isolation, reach out to each other online, build virtual communities, hold online events, perhaps while also trying to avoid the chilling drip drip of news? Uh, Dr. Garfield, any, any thoughts on that? Hello? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that is crucial. So I, I definitely agree. This is a traumatic event. This is an ongoing event. There's a lot of what we call these kind of quote unquote secondary stressors that are associated with it, you know, whether it's job loss or lower income or, um, you know, so forth. But I would really encourage people to do what they can. I mean, my research does show these kind of really negative effects of these disaster exposures. But, you know, also people are quite resilient. And we see actually resilience to traumatic events is is normative, right? So we do see these high levels of distress. But, you know, over time, you know, more people than not will will be resilient. And I really, you know, would encourage people to draw on whatever resources that they have to, to try to dig into that. You know, I think... Um, utilizing technology. The Zoom conferences are great. Staying in touch with people over call, over text. So, you know, I think the video chats that, you know, we, this, whether this empirically has been seen, um, you know, we, I, I mean, I, I can let you know that after the crisis is over, but, you know, just sort of anecdotally and what people are saying, you know, they are finding comfort in that kind of face-to-face -face connection, even if it's virtual. A lot of, um, for example, you know, yoga studios or fitness studios where people usually go to find that sense of community, they're actually offering online classes. So you can turn on uh, the internet and you can do those classes with your community online in real time. And, you know, that can kind of create that, you know, hey, I go to 530 yoga every day and I'm still going to go to 530 yoga every day. So, you know, I, I do think there are things people can dig into even in these trying times that can provide them a sense of community and a sense of comfort and peace. Mm -hmm. yes, some of my work colleagues are, uh, we're planning a virtual cocktail party where we sit around um, looking at each other and having drinks. Have you done it yet or are you just planning Not it? Yet. No, we're just planning it. We just came up with no. the idea yesterday. Okay. Speaking of resilience or the lack thereof, in China's Shanxi province, an unprecedented number of couples have filed for divorce following months-long quarantines for coronavirus. And this past weekend, Turkey issued a curfew for people over 65 who are now supposed to stay indoors barring an emergency. The Great Britain has also asked some of its elderly to self-isolate for as long as 12 weeks which, which is three months. That seems like a long time. Um, Dr. McAndrew, how might couples minimize the stress placed on their relationship? And what sort of impact might such long-term isolation have on older people who are already most at risk and thus probably a bit anxious to begin with? Yeah, that that's an interesting question. Um, and it's true. It's bad to be cooped up alone, but it can be bad in a different way to be cooped up with the same person uh, or people. There's some interesting old research from uh, people who winter over in Antarctica, where you're kind of uh, under lockdown for you know most of the year because it's too dark and cold to go outside. Uh, mm -hmm. NASA has also done some research. Um, with astronauts in training, uh, putting people together for months at a time to see how people will handle long space flights. And it's in all of these situations, you begin to focus on the thing about the person that's constantly there that's irritating. Every little habit, every little tick starts to get magnified over time, and you start having fantasies about exactly how you will strangle the person. And 
you know, you've got to avoid this. So giving each other some space, um, not being together in the same room all day, especially if you're watching the, the bad news, uh, is probably a way to start. And getting separate routines. In other words, you shouldn't necessarily have to do everything together. Uh, but some together time, of course, is also important. Part of the problem with the unchanging uh, nature of quarantine is we don't realize how much of our life we spend paying attention to st new stuff coming in. You're driving around, you're walking around, you're interacting with different people, you're in different places. When you're in the same place and nothing ever changes, either socially or physically, you start to kind of withdraw from that and focus inward. And for a lot of people, this takes a nasty turn. You start ruminating about your sorry state of existence and focusing on past things that you regret. And this can really feed the depression that we've been talking about. That's a great lead into my next question. A new paper by the Economic and Social Research Institute in Dublin found that extending isolation periods beyond the initial suggestion, which in this case would I guess be two weeks, risks demoralizing people and increasing their non-compliance. The, uh, the Lancet study I mentioned before, showed that those quarantined for more than 10 days showed significantly higher PTSD symptoms than those quarantined for less than 10 days. So it seems likely that in the coming days, millions or tens of millions of people around the world are going to start feeling deeply stressed, demoralized, and frustrated. This, to me, seems like a recipe for panic and violence in the streets, if not out and out rioting and looting. I could see people wrestling over the last roll of toilet paper or hurling insults hurling insults at their neighbor, whom they might blame for the pandemic. Already in Turkey, anti-Semitism has reportedly increased and attacked an Afghan immigrant, accusing him of bringing coronavirus to the country. These actions often devolve into something much worse. Dr. Garfin, how might a community, a neighborhood, a city avoid these undesirable behaviors and maintain stability as isolation lengthens and frustrations increase? Is it mainly about effective government communication? Uh, I think that I think that it is about effective government communication. Uh, I think, you know, my research has shown that when people are uncertain or they're getting these mixed messages, that is very difficult for people. Um, people like certainty, people like feeling in control. And these mixed messages that we've been seeing from governments at all levels, I think, are very difficult for people because they don't know what to do. Um, you know, people like to take action that they feel is effective. That's very good for people psychologically. So when they are in a place where they don't even know what that is, um, I think that that is kind of a comp that's compounding their psychological distress. Um, you know, I also think that, again, you know, and this is something, so we're, we're, we're currently conducting a longitudinal study um, of Americans and their, their psychological response to this event. You know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if the more that people are able to find a sense of social cohesion, the better that they're, they're going to do. So, you know, I would kind of encourage, you know, people when they're talking to their friends or, you know, if I could give a message to people that are, you know, leaders in the community um, to kind of implore people to find a sense of we're all in this together together because, um, you know, we know that social cohesion is a predictor of better outcomes. So if people can kind of feel that, you know, hey, like I the analogy of, you know, we're at war together, you know, because people are, are willing and able to make sacrifices, um, you know, towards the common good or to defeat a quote unquote an enemy. So I think that the more people can kind of psychologically identify with that sense of group, um, you know, we might see fewer negative effects or, or negative effects that are a little bit lower in magnitude. Could you just tell me a little bit more about that study you mentioned? Uh, oh, sorry, did, Dr. McAndrew, did you have something to add? I was just going to say, uh, I, I love that insight because it, what it would do is give you a sense of purpose. You know, you're doing something for the greater good rather than just wasting time. So that, I thought that was very good. Yeah. Yeah. Could you just tell me a bit more about that study you mentioned? How, um, how are you doing it and when do you expect to have some results? So the study that we launched uh, last week, we're still in the middle of data collection. Um, we are going to be following people, uh, Americans, for, for six weeks during this initial 
time. Um, we're hoping to survey about 6,000 Americans. Um, it's a nationally representative sample, so hopefully we'll be able to get uh, a, a just to be just to be clear, these are people who are isolated right now during the coronavirus pandemic. Well, they're Americans from all over the country. So some of them are, they're going to be isolated and exposed at different degrees. Um, and that's something my team and I have been very interested in, in how these different types of exposures uh elicit different responses in, in, in folks. So, you know, we might see people, we're going to have people in California who are, or New York who are experiencing, uh, you know, the outbreak in a much more kind of intense fashion and are under stricter quarantine regulations and so forth. And then we'll have folks from sort of, you know, middle America um, and these a little bit more rural states where, you know, the, some of the restrictions are not quite as great at this time, although that might change over the course of the study. And you expect to publish results in a, in a couple months or a few months, I guess? We're hoping, you know, we're going to get the data back probably within the next, uh, I'd say, two months. And I, we're uh, hopefully we'll be able to mobilize to get the data out there to people, uh, you know, as fast as we can. Okay. Let's close on a possible silver lining. A clinical psychologist at Canada's York University told The New Yorker this week about one positive byproduct pandemic. She said that for the past century... Humanity had focused on money, material things, and more recently technology, largely neglecting human relationships. And she said that in quarantine, she's reconnected with many friends she hasn't seen in decades and wondered if the painful experience of loneliness and isolation will, in the end, drive us to reconnect and strengthen our human connections. Perhaps both of you can give your – I'm talking more in the longer term. Perhaps both of you can give your thoughts on this. Let's start with Dr. McAndrew, please. Um, yeah, it, it could be a case of you don't know what you're, you've got until it's gone, right? You, you uh, take it for granted that this social world around you is just part of who you are, and you don't realize how important it is until it's taken away. And uh, to have to work a little harder at keeping those connections up uh, may make us feel like it's worthwhile. Yeah. And Dr. Garfman, anything? I certainly hope so. Um, you know, I, I certainly hope so. You know, I think it's, I think we've seen this increase in materialism, you know, over the past several decades. Um, you know, just an anecdotally, you know, that, that's not what tends to give people's people meaning in life. And, you know, I do think that if this situation is able, this, this pandemic or this, this event is, able to get people to reprioritize and find a little more meaning in their life that ultimately, you know, that is a potential positive psychological benefit because, uh, you know, the data shows that the more people are able to make sense of an event or find meaning in an event, uh, the better the outcomes for, for those folks are over time. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Uh, Frank McAndrew of Knox College and Dana Rose Garfin of the University of California, Irvine. Thank you so much for your time and insight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. You can follow AHWA News Online podcast series through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Spreaker. All you need to know about Turkey is here for your ears, mind, and attention. Thank you for listening to our podcast.